What's up, beautiful people? In this video, we'll be doing reaction to the geography of South Africa. Let's go! What's up, beautiful people? And welcome to another episode of Don't Keep Up With, Don't Keep, Don't Keep Up With the Joneses. Don't, don't Keep Up With the, Don't Keep Up With the Joneses. Don't Keep Up With, Don't Keep, Don't Keep Up With the Joneses. Don't, don't Keep Up With the, Don't Keep Up With the Joneses. Ba -ba 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 What's up, beautiful people? It's me, Brigitte Jones Jr. You're back again for another reaction video. And as it was requested, we will be doing a reaction to Geography Now in South Africa. So let's go ahead and get into it. I'm going to put on my reaction shades. Bing! And we're going to go ahead and have some fun. Shall we learn? Shall we learn something new? I don't know, but we about to find out. <laughs> And you can probably guess why. For one, the country lies at the bottom of the continent of Africa, bi-coastal between the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. In fact, the southernmost point of the African continental mainland... Already learned something new. I didn't even realize that the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans were on either side of South Africa. Like, I knew it was around an ocean or ocean was around it. However, the two separate oceans being there is pretty legit. I wonder if that's where, like, they come together and it's like salt water and fresh water but it's like a line in between i don't know maybe we'll find out we'll see bagulas has a cool spot you can check out with a plaque and a giant africa map monument from there they are bordered by six other countries don't forget little eswatini and the entirely enclaved country of lesotho from there the country is divided into nine provinces the country doesn't have one official capital but rather three pretoria which holds the executive branch including the home of the president as well as most of the embassies for international diplomats the legislative branch is held in cape town where you can find the national parliament and second largest city in the country and bloemfontein near the center of the country hosts the judicial branch branch and the Supreme Court of Appeal. Some say technically Johannesburg could also be considered maybe a fourth capital because it has the constitutional court and the city has a huge level of significance as the largest and busiest city of the country. But eh, you decide. Johannesburg that right there is already informative to know that Pretoria, which is close to Johannesburg, is its own thing. It's I caught it all, but I'm I, I didn't remember it all. But that that right there, come on, South Africa, y'all already impressing me. Not like you haven't already before. Also hosts the biggest and busiest airport in South Africa, OR Tambo International, whereas the second and third largest airports lie respectively in the second and third largest cities, Cape Town and Durban's King Shaka International. The country has a wide network of roadways and the most well-developed rail system in all of Africa. Johannesburg being the main central hub that spiderwebs all the other main lines that stretch into every other province and abroad into neighboring countries. South Africa also boasts... So that's interesting because in South Africa, I was even thinking to myself as I was driving around, I did not see a railroad system. Now, when I did the hop on hop off tour, I did see where it was like a whole bunch of uh, cars and things like that where trains could do what they do. However, like driving over railroad tracks, I never did. So I'm very interested as to where the railroads are in Johannesburg. Hmm structure with the second busiest container port in all of Africa after Port Said in Egypt, the port of Durban, which provides 60% of all South Africa's shipping revenue. Finally, South Africa's island or insular region are mostly confined to small patches along the coast like the Port Elizabeth Bay or Robin Island just north of Cape Town, famous for being the spot where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned. However, if we include the entire domain belonging to South Africa, then Prince Edward and Marion Island, which belong to the Western Cape Province, are the actual southernmost points of the African continent. These islands are mostly uninhabited with the exception of a meteorological station and bunkers for scientists. I never knew this existed. Like, where is that on the globe? I need to find it on the globe. Like, these two islands? Southern part of South Africa? That's impressive because I, I, I never knew. I'm learning so much already. The southernmost point on Marion Island is called Cape Hooker, literally. So, okay, you're probably wondering, why isn't the Sufi part of South Africa? Yeah, why? Hmm. Well, long story short, it was kind of like... UK! Okay, if you help me kick his ass, I'll be one of your protectorates. You got a deal. <coughs> I got him. Woo! Hey, your king died, and we want to make you a part of the Cape Colony. Oh, no, I'll just stick with protectorate. Well, we don't like that. Okay, well, I guess that means we'll spend the next 14 years resisting and giving you a headache. Deal. We give up. We'll give you guys self-rule as a separate crown colony. You guys suck, but whatever. It's better than being part of the Cape Colony. 
South Africa is now going to become its own country, and we want you to be in it. Oh, hell no. Oh, come on. We're going to have very tense, racially divisive apartheid policies that will disenfranchise your people. Okay, how do you see that as conducive to the benefit of my people? <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't. All right. Well, enjoy your self-rule. And from there, it pretty much sealed the deal that Lesotho would never join South Africa. Anyway. That's pretty legit how they just put all of that history of years of going back and forth, wars probably, and things like that in that much of a time span. But to even know how it remains its own country is pretty cool and very interesting like I did not know until now so legit information like I'm, I'm tapping in because your boy is learning something new it's an interesting thing even though South Africa is a republic the Constitution includes the traditional leadership clause which recognizes the certain indigenous monarchs yeah today there are about 13 monarchs from nine different ethno-linguistic groups and tons of other smaller paramounts and high chiefs in South Africa hmm. although they do not have direct legislative power to the Republic, they have a high degree of regional influence and involvement in communal affairs. Sadly, shortly before filming this episode, Zulu King Goodwill's Walitini passed away. He ruled for five decades and had a huge role of significance in the Zulu community. Wow, he was a king. A king. Well, in any case, let's talk about some of the top notable spots and let's have South African influencer and travel writer Gofari do it for us. Gofari, take it away. Hey everyone, I'm Gofari, a South African travel blogger, and I'm going to talk you through the notable sites to visit in South Africa. So first off, legit, I need to go find her. If, if you know her and you follow her, like legit that she even found her way on this here video just representing the country in its own unique way so tapping in tapping in i'm going to talk through the cultural and the man-made sites we have blokram's bridge which is the highest bridge bungee in the world we also have many theme parks like gold reef yeah i'm not i'm not doing the bungee scenario but it's cool to know that it's there gold reef city come on joe berg i did a reaction to this one which i'm excited to go there Whoa, Palace of the Lost City, they went by that so fast. I gotta find a video. Our District 6 Museum, the world's largest pineapple, the big hole, Orlando Towers. Book. Hmm. Did, did y'all think what I thought when I saw the world's largest pineapple? Like, did anybody get SpongeBob vibes? Could SpongeBob could have been a thought after seeing the pineapple? And could it, could it be? Could it be? Another round of Africa being the pioneers of things that we see, but they never knew it was started in Africa. Like, hmm. Fab Tree Bar. We have 10 UNESCO World Heritage Sites, such as Mapungugwe and also Robben Island, which is where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned. Thank you. Thanks, Gofari. You are awesome. Check out her Instagram and pages in the links in the description below. But yeah, South Africa's natural wonders, you won't even know where to begin with. Like, they have the largest cave system in Africa, the Congo Caves, Borkslux Potholes, the tallest waterfall in Africa, and it just goes on and on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold yeah, 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 yeah. Like he said, whoa, 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 whoa. We can't just go past these facts just like that because... Y Did y'all hear what was said? The caves, the waterfalls. The list goes on like come on and we all just in south africa how could so much preciousness be contained in one area come on versus catherine that's the nature stuff you're going to that's we're going to talk about that in the next segment we'll, we'll uh, uh, the next segment which is so south africa one word blessed for one, the country is a low-risk malaria nation, and most areas in the wilderness don't even require medication. They even have their own unique biome called Fainbos, the smallest and the richest of the six floral kingdom in the world, only found in southern Africa with over 6,000 endemic plant species, including the national flower, which is the king protea. Mm. When I think of South Africa, that's what I see in my mind, always. Specifically Fainbos. Specifically Fainbos, yes. Mm. It's also home to the... Now granted, I don't know what all to do with that whole scenario, however, to realize that it's able to contain such a ecosystem, like, I'm already feeling comfortable, right? <laughs> Let me know, where can we find that tea? That Robos or the Rayobos or however you say that tea situation? Where can we find it? I'm gonna find it next time I go. You can't find it anywhere that looks like South Africa. 
For one, the country is unlike any other nation in that it's not only the southernmost portion of the East African Rift, but the entire country is kind of split between a semicircle mountain range known as the Great Escarpment. It feeds into the tallest range, the Drakensberg Mountains, in the east, where you can find the tallest peak, Mafadi, shared with Lesotho. These mountains are also the source of the longest river in the country, the Orange River, which mm. ends in the Atlantic Ocean. South Africa doesn't have many large natural lakes, and the majority of inland bodies of water are man-made reservoirs, the largest one being the Harip Dam, located in the center of the country. The largest natural freshwater lake, though, is speculated to be Sibai, part of KwaZulu-Natal's Greater St. Lucia Wetland Park on the East Coast, a UNESCO heritage site. If you zoom out a little bit, you'll notice the Great Escarpment has these sharp, narrow, parallel wrinkles at the bottom. These are called the Cape Mountains, which are essentially leftover sediments smashed by contrasting tectonic activity long ago, when South Africa was connected to Argentina and Antarctica in the Gondwana supercontinent. Above these wrinkles, you have the Great Karoo, Namakaland, Bushmanland, and Kalamari, which are dry, arid, rocky areas is sparsely populated and loaded with rich flora of succulent plants and minerals. I don't know if y'all able to catch everything that was said, but uh nice. <laughs> East and north of the escarpment, you have the Eastern Midlands, KwaZulu-Natal coast, sweeping up to the Lowveld and the Limpopo Lowveld in the north. These are the most lush and green areas of South Africa and hold much of the arable land as well as nature and forest preserves. When you move inland though, you get the Highvelds, the Bushveld, and Hrikaland west, which are the arid savannas of South Africa. This is probably one of the most unique areas of South Africa because it is the site where two things happen. One, an enormous meteor hit this spot, creating the largest verified impact crater on Earth known as the Fredford Crater standing over 300 kilometers wide. You can even see the dome from space at the town of Fredford. And two, said meteor was supposedly the source of many minerals like gold and platinum that fed the land, which later the inhabitants would subsequently discover and go... Time out. Come on. Did you know meteors from the sky contain such thing as gold and other minerals in them? I, I, I did not know that. I must say, I did not know that. However, finding out and realizing that it does take place, but then not only does it take place, but it has taken place in South Africa? Like, come on, can it get any better? But do y'all hear like all the different things that are there? You have the mountainous area, you have the green grassland area, but you also have the Sahara type vibes, like so many different types of ecosystems, all and climates, all within one given country after in a mad gold rush and mining rush. Now, although South Africa is the second largest economy in Africa after Nigeria, it is ranked the most industrialized, technologically advanced, and economically diversified. And although the country does have a wide income gap between the wealthy and poor, the middle class has been growing every year since the 90s. Today, South Africa is one of the world's top platinum and chromium producer. They consistently rank in the top 10 producers of gold and diamonds as well. And Come on, platinum? Diamonds and gold. Granted, you won't see your boy in any type of digging escapades. However, to know that the platinum, the diamonds, and the gold can be found there, you know, if I have a little spare time in my backyard, I'd get a little shovel to see what I can find. The gold rush in Vitbata's Sudan in 1886 pretty much established the country as a mineral powerhouse. I find it's only about 5% of the population is formally employed in farming. This means they've shifted much of their economic activity towards other sectors like manufacturing, business, and finance. Today, JSE Limited is the largest stock exchange in Africa, ranking 17th in the world with over trillions of dollars of investment revenue. South Africa also boasts some of the best medical facilities in Africa and has the third largest hospital in the world. Sadly, though, South Africa does have the highest population of people infected with HIV at over 7.5 million and fourth in the world per population ratio. There's even a character on their version of Sesame Street who has HIV to help kids born with AIDS to cope. And finally, the country has a huge tourism industry, mostly in the nature. If that is that is unique, right? Like to even think that they thought ahead of the kids and for the kids to have a character and their version of Sesame Street to have AIDS because of how many people on and in the country have AIDS. Like, man, that sucks, right? But then also to know that they have then thought ahead to say, let's go ahead and show love and plan ahead to the kids. Like, that's nice for that. But man, fourth in the world, we have to see what we can do to change that. Change is going to come. 
is, speaking of nature, it's time for Gary Hollow to explain. Gary Hollow's Animal Adventure. That's the best I got. South Africa is home to over 20 national parks and dozens of nature reserves. The most famous and visited ones being the Table Mountain National Park and the largest one, Kruger National Park in the Northeast. South Africa is ranked the sixth out of the 17 classified mega diverse countries in the world. 10th for plant species and third for marine endemism. In fact, who knew? Third in marine biology or whatever is in South Africa? Where, 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 where are they teaching that? I, if it wasn't for this video, I would have never known that information. Like, keep feeding me. Keep feeding me. Between May to July, the sardine run happens in which billions of sardines spawn in the cool waters of the Agulhas Bank, creating a feeding frenzy for all the ocean predators. Look at them go, chomping. Jaws. <laughs> And there's over 850 bird species, including the national bird, the blue crane. But more interesting, South Africa and Namibia are the only two countries in Africa that host penguins. The endangered African or Cape penguin is unique in that it has pink glands above its eyes to help regulate body temperature. Since South That's amazing. South Africa, Namibia, only two countries in all of the continent of Africa to host and have penguins. Pretty, pretty cool. Come on. Africa is generally much warmer than the typical habitat for penguins like, you know, Antarctica. There's nearly 300 mammal species inhabiting the wilderness, including the national animal, the springbok. There's even an entire national park dedicated to elephants in the south. And finally, South Africa is not only home to many animals, but also extinct animal fossils. The Karoo region has more dinosaur fossil sites than any other place in the country, and numerous dinos have been excavated. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of dinos, I got a philosopher. Wrap this up. Thank you, Gary. And speaking of wraps, it's time to end up the segment as we always do. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. Boom. All right, let's roll. South Africa has so many unique dishes, but one thing is guaranteed. You will see meat on almost every menu. No shocker, they are the largest meat producer in Africa. In any case, here are some of the top dishes you guys suggested. Popping horse, milk tart, fricadelle, bunny chow, cook sisters, malva pudding, quirky coast, fat cakes, bopani worms, savory pies, Cape Malay curry, babua tea, biltong, the western cake. What's crazy is out of all those things that they listed, I only recognize one of them and that's the biltong which is similar to our beef jerky or jerkies in general right they have even stands in the malls where they have different flavors and kinds of i'm gonna call it jerky because i'm probably butchered the way they actually say it boon tong and butong or whatever whatnot but all that to say like those other foods where are they located i was in johannesburg just last week and none of those things i saw let me know down below where can we find those foods that were just listed probably has some of the most refined wineries in the world starting all the way back to 1659 and supposedly route 62 is the longest wine route in the world going over 850 kilometers long and of course many might argue the national dish would be braai or south african style barbecue cooked over wood flames whoa noah you're back okay cool thanks noah uh, and don't forget to get some burgers from wimpy's and a rib meal from stairs on wacky wednesday and make sure that you go to spur spur has the two for one special on mondays <laughs> And speaking of the people of South Africa, uh, I think that means we should probably move on to the next segment. The... And the dope thing about those foods that they listed at the end what the lady did, those things are usually at the malls. And so the Wimpies, the Spurs or Stirs or however you say it, uh, pretty legit. Pretty legit menus, I must say so myself. Like just even being there and eating from them, I was like, man, this stuff is legit. And from the u.s perspective the dollar goes a long way okay so you can eat royally but not have to spend a lot therefore in the food segment that part is definitely a plus to uh those with american dollars however well said the bride and even with the brides right at the homes people have brides there and the crazy thing is sometimes the brides are inside of the homes as well as on outside or outside area and so 
it could be interesting. A friend of mine has a bride right in his family room and I asked him, has he lit it and done anything with it? He was like, nah, but maybe because he's from the States and don't know what to do with it. But the bride situation is a real situation in South Africa. Now I asked you guys, the South African Jagger Peeps, what it means to be South African. And here are some things you guys said. Being South African is very nice because we have so many different types of uh, traditional groups where everyone is celebrating. We come from a beautiful country. We're full of cultural diversity. And of course, we truly epitomize the rainbow nation. To be South African means to live in the most beautiful country in the world and to be part of the most vibrant and energetic group of people. We're quite resilient when it comes to the challenges we face as well they have got a strong, strong sense of pride living in a post-apartheid era um, i feel that we have a lot of unity we have a lot of strength and we are really heroes for the challenges that we face every week and that we overcome and we always find a way to remain in the game and strong it's an absolute miracle if you got to see the 2019 rugby world cup in japan and seeing how diverse and incredible uh, south african um you know athletes were it's ever changing it's always evolving so many different art movements and interesting things going on it's an incredible thing i am especially appreciative of the fact that i don't have to travel far to experience something different each of its nine provinces are so unique in their landscapes and their cultures in their flavors so it's that that's what makes it such a fun and exciting place to be thank you guys that is so very true. Now, I want you to take note of all of the different varieties of ethnicities that were even represented in the people speaking of their experiences in South Africa. And that is what you can truly expect to see when you're walking through the malls, when even you're at church or you're out and about just like living your everyday lives. You will see a diversity of people everywhere that you go. And to the point that one of them made, it's truly a rainbow nation. Like, it's so refreshing truth be told from the classrooms and the list goes on neighborhoods i can keep going right but all that to say truly diversity is in south africa what about you catherine well i would say that every weekend is a joel joel what was it joel what is that so if you're gonna go for a joel you're gonna go for a party and it's gonna be like a really insane night like you if you're gonna go joel you're gonna go like really hard that night Hmm, okay. Now, as you will find out, South Africa is very diverse in terms of ethno-linguistic people groups. Let's start with a pie chart, shall we? The country has about 60 million people and has the largest white and Asian populations and percentages per population in all of Africa. The country is made up predominantly of black Africans at about 80%. However, keep in mind, of this 80%, there are many groups. Zulus and Kalsa are the largest ones at about 23% and 16%, followed by the Northern Sutu and Swana at about 9% and 8%. And from there, there's a bunch of other groups, but we'll talk about them later in this episode. For the remaining 20% of the population, the white South Africans and coloreds have almost identical populations at somewhere around 9% each. Keep in mind though, amongst the white population, about 60% of them are Afrikaners and 35% are English, the remaining 5 or so percent being other Europeans. The rest of the population is mostly made up of Asians like Indians, Malays, Chinese, and so on. <laughs> What's cool about that as well is when you're there or if you get the opportunity to be in South Africa or even if you live in South Africa, you know this to be so. And so while you're there, as you may be just talking to people or about to start a conversation, some South Africans will start in a native tongue. And so you saw the Afrikaans, the Zulus and the other places and things like that where people are from. And so they may speak from their native tongue, their native dialect to somebody that looks like they're from that same tribe or group of people. And it's cool because maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. As I was talking to somebody even at the train station, he told me he was about to speak to me and I forgot forgot to the dialect but i was like i'm glad you didn't english is all i know however i appreciate that i took it as a compliment that you thought he thought i look like x right um with x being like the, the the tribe of the group but um it's pretty cool how that works like truth be told and you could be in the midst of a conversation they can switch from english to zulu to english to Botswana. like the list goes on but I just love how it all comes together. The South African rand is their currency and they also use the M plug outlet and they also drive on the left side of the road. Left, former British colony. 
Mm -hmm. And also, somewhere around 80% of the country is Christian, mostly adhering to Protestantism. So first off, let's clarify some confusing distinctions. So you heard that word, colors. Okay, we Americans might have some horrible pre-civil rights flashbacks when we hear that word, but we assure you, it's totally safe to use here in South Africa, right? Yeah. It is totally safe, and I actually did use that word a few times in America, and I didn't know what I was doing until one of my friends that was American, he actually pulled me aside and he was like, No. <laughs> now, there's no complete definitive genetic makeup requirement, but color people are essentially people that are mixed mostly between blacks and whites, although you can also have some Asian in there as well. It's not uncommon. Basically, yes. After all the mixing, they kind of just made a new race. Sarah Tishkoff, a geneticist at the University of First off, I didn't even know that color was actually what we in America would call light skin. And I thought color meant anything other than white. But to know that there is a white colored black. Noted. Lena did a genetic study that concluded that the Cape Colors of South Africa have the highest levels of mixed ancestry in the world. So yeah, they're literally the children of the earth. And that other word, Afrikaner, what is that? Well, long story short, they're descended from the people brought in by the Dutch settlers in the 1600s. Keep in mind though, only about 40% of Afrikaners are directly Dutch descended and the rest were mostly German and French. Dutch and Afrikaans are about 90 to 95% mutually intelligible. South Africa has about 35 indigenous languages, but 11 official languages. Anyway, these are 11 languages languages are divided into five families. And of the languages, English is the preferred language of the intercommunication between all peoples. And and I will say too, as they talked about the five families of languages, what I understood as well is that if you were to learn like one of the languages of a particular family, as it's called here, you could as well talk between two other ones. So per one, like a family is like three different languages in a given bubble. And so that's even cool. So as the kids are in school and things like that, learning maybe Zulu um, or something else, then they may be able to talk as well to two other um, groups of people that may not speak actual Zulu, but they may be able to either understand what they're saying or speak some words to them as they're talking. True be told, a lot of people that we met in South Africa, they speak 11 languages, some as low as five. So crazy crazy from five to 11 languages she only said like two or three but you know people can get by with what they could get by with really appreciated when a black south african sees a white south african speaking their language yeah. oh it absolutely is and that's something that i have not mastered we are taught because in school for example it, it it isn't to the degree that Afrikaans is, is taught you don't really become fluent like i can understand certain things but not a lot yeah i think uh, port elizabeth was changed to Patella yes, or something it was. like that yeah. exactly you said that good and yes many of the muni languages like zulu and kosa have the click sounds Mm -hmm. These clicks were actually borrowed though. See, of the black Africans, the majority are Bantu. Believe it or not, they are not the original inhabitants of South Africa. Archaeological evidence suggests that they migrated somewhere estimated around the 3rd century AD. The Khoi Khoi and San people, often collectively called the Khoisan, make up less than 1% of the population today, and they are the earliest known inhabitants with ancestors dating back somewhere around 100 to 200,000 years, making them speculated to be some of the oldest peoples on Earth. They have the original click languages. Quick history lesson. Over time, the Bantus came in and dominated with their iron tools and farming practices. And although they displaced many of the Khoisan, anthropologists and sociologists speculate that there must have been some intermingling because the click consonants were adopted in their languages. Over a millennium later, the Dutch were first Europeans to come in and establish Cape Town and then brought in their farmers known as Boers. Meanwhile, hundreds of miles east, Shaka Zulu was unifying most of the Muni tribes in the early 19th century and drove out many of the rival tribes like the Matabele, Makololo, and the Fengu. This was... There is so much rich history and information in this content. Like, it's amazing what they're able to do in such a short period of time and how much I can learn if I was to take the time to approach it that way. But even in just doing this reaction video, I'm in awe of the level of detail that they have given to us and for us to be able to learn about South Africa in less than an hour. Like, come on as the Mpetene, or the Great Crushing and Displacement. Enter the British. This is where the story gets really complicated, so here's a quick cutaway to help. 
I'm taking Cape Town, while the Netherlands has problems in Europe. Well, I'm just gonna go run away then and make my own republics in the north. Hi, I'm Jessica, and I'm the senior designer for Revive Kitchen and Bath in Tampa, Florida. I work... Get out! You're not even from this continent! Make me! Oh, I'll make you- Oh! Hey! Bollocks! There's like a ton of gold and diamonds in your new republic areas! Move over! Hell no! Yeah, there's a lot more that goes into that, but basically it was a chain of weird multi-level, multi-party, multi-ethnic battles and subjugation. In addition to the countless native Bantus killed in wars, there were two broad wars between the British and Afrikaners, which led to 10% of the white Afrikaner population being killed. So you had one European power subjugating another European group on a continent neither were native to, all dealing with the natives. So, in a nutshell, I want the land. I was here centuries before you. I was here over a millennium before you. Seriously, are we really doing this? In any case, after the country gained independence in 1910 as a union and fully sovereign in 1931, it underwent a controversial period of apartheid or apartheid in 1948 all the way up to 1994. This I will say there is a apartheid museum where it talks through what they just did. Um, however, that museum is far more extensive as opposed to what they did and I, I love the overview that they gave because it gives it to you in a quick fast you know fast-paced type uh, way however awesome awesome essentially divided peoples by racial lines and put strict laws that were obviously racist and not like you know equivalent to you know certain extreme factions of microaggression culture that blames pretty much everything on racism i mean like literally it was actually written approved and enacted in legal policy racist under the homeland system most of the black population was concentrated in the ethno states called bantustans where only 13 percent of the land was reserved for the majority of the black populace to have property in rules and services were different for colored people as well like and the asian minorities it was very complicated are often arbitrarily drawn. Some of the colored people were allowed in Parliament in the 70s and some weren't. Some minorities were labeled in the same group as coloreds, while some, like the Lebanese, Taiwanese, Koreans, Japanese, they all shared actually the same classification level for whites. It was confusing and weird, yeah. Eventually, after a number of factors pressured them, apartheid ended with full democratization for blacks in 1994, and that's when things got very incredibly tense. See, in Africa, a transition of power like that usually goes one of two ways. One, a spiteful uprising from the native black population built on vengeance that seeks to dispose most of the white population and expropriate everything from them or number two find a way to move forward as one people with a new system built on forgiveness acknowledging that it will be awkward and difficult but peace cannot come from a bitter heart today of course it's still a very complicated issue and there's no universal narrative and everyone agrees with and yes controversial incidents still occur crime is which is interesting too because when talking to people living in South Africa that has gone through and grown through and experienced apartheid, they do talk about the effects of it. However, I will say being in the business that I have been there, I have not. I feel that the people are loving, caring, and open to diversity like me. And so, hmm in certain areas due to social stress and poverty and yes there's the whole BEE movement thing which started as a program aimed to integrate the black population into the workforce but it has a lot of controversial undertones and with implementation I'm sure you could probably say a lot of stuff about that yeah. you and the other South Africans then there's the energy crisis or load shedding issue you'll actually wake up in the morning and you'll get a message on your phone because we have an app that will tell you it's from 6 a.m. to maybe like 2 p.m. you won't have any energy at all at least they have an app that warns you <laughs> And that's, that's like a thing. That load shedding is a thing. However, on some sites, right, I can see where if you're in a factory and the lights cut off, that could be ridiculously a nuisance to your workday. And the list goes on of other reasons why. Um, but I will say that at hospitals, you won't have to worry about it. And certain areas of government, you don't have to worry about load shedding um, or load sharing is what I saw here. However, on the positive side, I do think that it could be looked at positively with the idea that we as people can take breaks from electronics like some people are so into their phones looking down and not looking around at what's going on they're missing the day they're missing people walking by and so i look at low shedding as a, just a reminder that there's more to life than the electronics that we are a part of and so yeah no i always try to find a benefit or the good in all things so yeah 
that's new. That's new. We didn't always have that. Oh, okay. Mm, it was mm. very recent. They're working on it. <laughs> yeah. But the point is, there's so much stuff. If you guys want to write about it in the comments, if you're from South Africa, I implore you to have a civil discussion, which I know on YouTube is almost impossible. But I don't know. Watch the movie Invictus if you want to get an idea on how it started. Oh, and uh, speaking of Invictus, let's move on to a lighter note. Let's talk about the sports. Here's Art with the sports part. Hey, guys. Whoa. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. It's me and Tarkin. We're back. All right, I gotta put Tarkin down so we can start. Specifically, rugby. Their national team, the Springboks, have won the World Cup three times, tied with New Zealand. In fact, South Africa is one of only two countries that has hosted the soccer, rugby, and cricket World Cups. In fact, they are actually the only African country to host a soccer World Cup so far. Fun fact, South Africans are actually one of the only countries that, like us Americans, also call football Soccer. Cheers to you guys. Soccer makes no. Cheers, 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 cheers. I didn't even know that, but I'm even that much more comfortable with the kids going to school calling soccer, soccer, and I haven't to learn football. All right. Hence, but we're together in our wrongness. Otherwise, cricket is probably the third most popular sport, and their national team, the Proteus, usually ranks in the world's top 10 best teams. Otherwise, at the Olympics, they've done pretty well in the swimming and athletics department, racking up 26 gold medals so far. Gold is better than silver. They've all Every time, all the time. Now, cricket, he didn't talk about cricket, probably because he knows about cricket as much as I know about cricket. <laughs> I know nothing about cricket, so I will definitely be trying to figure out what it's like, how to do it, and what. So probably look out for a reaction video to cricket. In tennis powerhouses as well, Johan Creek won two Australian Grand Slam titles in the 80s. That's a big deal. In certain areas, you might find a touch of Dutch with things like corf ball. Also originating in South Africa is ring ball, which is basically another variation of corf ball. <laughs> Yuxke is a traditional Afrikaner sport similar to horseshoes in which you have to knock over a peg on the ground from a distance. And many of the native peoples have their own style of martial arts. The most renowned probably being the Nuni stick fighting or Donga, performed mostly by the Zulu or the Alt. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> that was horrible. Alt that people. That's better, yeah. Okay, and that's it for me. I'm gonna get the out of here. I'll see ya. Thank you, Art. And it all with it all, I get the overall idea that he's going for, that there are sounds and ways of saying names of people and groups of people. So, you know, I'm not going to take it as he was trying to make fun, but more than anything, just making fun of his inability to say it correctly. It's also really well known for surfing. And if you ever just want to watch a competition and have a great jolt, you can go Joel. to J Bay. Yes, exactly. That's that what again? would happen. So, as we mentioned, South Africa has a huge diversity of ethnolinguistic people groups. We already made a video explaining about some of them, but let's just quickly cover the main ones. First, you have the Nguni group. This group includes the cousins Zulus, Osas, and the Ndebele peoples. Zulus are probably the most well known worldwide. You may have seen images of their traditional animal skin warrior attire or weaponry and dance ceremonies for the men. Women often wear those wide, conical Isicholo hats on special occasions. For the Osa, they are kind of like the pacifist siblings of the Zulus. Their traditional garbs have those black and white patterns with beads and red ochre dyed blanket coverings. Ndebele are like the artists, known for their colorful patterns, painted houses, the symbols are unique to each family. And they are also the bead experts, and they'll form heavy beaded neck and leg ornaments on special occasions. Finally, the Swazi people are basically cousins to the people of the Swatini, known for honoring their kings with Mklanga or reed dawn. Then we have the- That's pretty Pretty legit like the even the distinctions of the different groups of people but then as well as what they are known for just on the overall diversity of people in a given area like oh, so much to learn so much experience so much to see and I'm excited that I'm gonna be able to do so in Johannesburg or excuse me South Africa the whole the whole country group made up of the Sutu, the Tswana, and the Sepedi peoples. They are rel relatives to the people of Lesotho and Botswana, and many of them are mountain people. You can see lots of them riding horses and wearing Makarotlo hats and Basutu blankets. The temperatures are generally colder with high elevations. The Tswana people have eight major clans, and they love the color blue, especially with the Letishi cloth. The Songa are known for their many, many initiation rituals and electric dance style or Songa disco. The Venda people are some of the most isolated groups in the north, famous for their natural medicines and the masangwe or bare knuckle fist fight sport which people
people use to kind of like monitor and solve disputes. Now for non-Africans, we already explained about the- That is interesting that uh, bare knuckle fighting is a thing and a way of living for a group of people. And uh, I don't know, because they didn't say in the groups of people, but while we were there, there was an Uber driver that was driving us to let us know that there was a group of people that live well over a hundred years old and they are like off the grid. They don't listen to the radio, watch TV or don't even have TV. They don't refrigerate their food and the list goes on. And because of those things, it, they have a high lifespan. And so I don't know which one it fits in, but I'm going to definitely try to do some like on the ground research because I'm highly intrigued. Are unique in the way that they kind of develop their own breakaway Africanized culture from the European ancestors. What are you, by the way? I'm English. Oh, okay. I'm yeah. an English through and through. The colored community has always kind of had a unique status as the somewhat marginalized but not as marginalized group. They've always kind of had to figure out who they were since they technically didn't fully belong anywhere. It's, yeah. Then you have the Asian community, the largest groups being of the Cape Malays and the Indians, brought over during colonial times for their indentured servitude. The Burkhard neighborhood of Cape Town is essentially the Malay quarter and today their culture is a fascinating mixture that blends elements of Dutch and Asian. In fact, most of them actually speak Afrikaans as their first language and the Malay language is almost all but gone. The Indian community was brought in by the British and Durban has one of the highest population of Indians huh. outside of India. Most were brought over from West and South India, including Gandhi who spent 21 years living in the area. Durban has the second largest population of Indians outside of India. That says a lot, right? But then not only does it says a lot, but in Johannesburg, a large population of Indians are there. But what I'm saying this to say is the food is also there as well. And we were able to indulge ourselves in some great Indian cuisine, eating a naan bread, which was huge. Y'all have to check out a vlog. I'll put a link down below for the vlog that we did where we were able to eat that naan bread. And it was enormous. We weren't even able to eat half of it but saying all that to say Indian food is very good food so thank you thank you for bringing that down yeah that was a lot that wasn't even scratching the surface there's so many other people groups we didn't even talk about but in any case here's Hannah to explain a little bit more about the few things that South Africa's people have collectively as one entity one entity eternity <laughs> you get the point Hannah's culture segment random Hannah <laughs> See China before communism. Woo! South Africa! Guys, get a random Hannah shirt at geographynow.com. So, all right, obviously there is no such thing as a single type of South African, but in the end, they are still one country that moves forward to the best of their ability. For one, many of the native ethnic groups, whether Zulu or Venda, follow the Labola system, in which the groom must pay a dowry in cattle to the bride's family. I love the countries where they pay people with cow. Remember Rwanda? Yes, I freaked out. I was like, what? There is literally a Labolo app available now to help relieve the stress of figuring how many cattle you owe. Township art became very popular. That is so true. Uh store owner um that we knew and came in or know that came in contact with he was or is now married to his wife but on one side right so they do the culture side where they you know trade cows but really they do cash now instead of cows and then they also have like a western wedding which people in america we know weddings to be such as this way so they have two different weddings which can cost them a lot them as in the groom um, or the male has to pay a lot of money to have a wedding because it's two and so all that to say like it's intense I'm glad I did it in America and I could just move over and have some fun over there. We're in the 60s and 70s. It was sort of a social commentary movement that depicted the impoverished black communities of South Africa to move towards the end of apartheid. In addition, you will notice there are so many different architecture styles in South Africa. You have everything from the massive thatched fortified dome huts of Zulu to the Cape Dutch style homes inspired from the Dutch with flat pro stepped gable roofs. South Africans have also been front runners in many inventions, discoveries, and innovations. For example, the automatic pool cleaner, the CAT scan, 
putty adhesive, the Smart Lock Safety Syringe, the world's first heart transplant happened here, the Yellow Fever Vaccine, and they have the biggest optical telescope in the Southern Hemisphere, and so on. What a Come on with the inventions. I have some ideas that I'm willing to, you know, share with a brother or sister in South Africa. Like, if we can get what's in here in the world, let's talk. I'll give you 40%. I'm, I'm, that, I'm that generous. Fun fact, being South African means knowing the difference between now, 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 and just now. Ah uh, yes, thank you Jay. South Africa has also been the location shot of many feature films and TV shows. Everything from the debuting film The Gods Must Be Crazy, Academy Award winner Sotsi, which I actually watched last night. Amazing movie. Academy Award nominated District 9 and Chappie. And of course, Mandela Long Walk to Freedom. What's your takeaway from South African cinema? There's some amazing comedy, which I feel like people don't talk about that much. I've been watching a lot of Leon Schuster movies. Yeah. And finally, the one thing that unifies all South Africans is Heritage Day, in which people are encouraged to wear their traditional costumes and express their background. And everyone joins in a bride together, no matter who you are. Usually the festivals include an abundance of music. So to expound more on that, here's Keith. Blah, blah, blah. Wait, Keith isn't here. How's he going to be in this video? <laughs> That's pretty cool to know that there is an Heritage Day, which is in September. Very, very cool. Excited to be there for that, to experience that. So I wonder, being American, do we wear American flag? Do we wear American colors? Like, what do we do? Or do we just watch what is being done because it's not relevant? I don't know. In Florida, and guess what? You can't cancel me. Anyways, South Africa, they have so much going on. Even their national anthem is sung in five different languages. Basically, from the beginning, traditional vocals were used, along with the marimba, the uhadi, the kora, and other assorted hand drums and harps. The first style of music to really take over the world, probably Marabi. Now, Marabi started out in the slums of Johannesburg, and Marabi is a style of music that is basically underground swing jazz. From there, world-renowned artists such as Soweto Gospel Choir and Lady Smith Black Mombazo have put South Africa on the map. Every South African will definitely know Johnny Clegg, the white Zulu who wrote songs in Zulu to criticize apartheid. Today, South Africa is known predominantly for its popularity in house music, and more specifically for the subgenres of Wham and I'm a piano. I'm I'm a piano. You guys told us to definitely mention those styles of music. Some other South African artists that you may be familiar with are Diane Wood for their crazy hip hop South African -y fusion style of music. You guys might know Synth Peter, who I think has one of the greatest songs ever written. It's called Doof Doof. Shall it all go jam to Doof Doof? Yeah. Yeah, that's it for me. Hope you guys had a good one, and back to you all. I'm gonna do some reactions to those. Like, let me know in the comment section below which one of those musicians or songs from what they've done we should do a reaction to, and we will. Thank you, Keith. All right, so this is the part where we talk about some of the famous people of South Africa, and here's South African geography, Colo, to explain. South Africa is as talented as it is diverse. A few notable South Africans that you geography peeps might be familiar with include Charlize Theron, John Carney, Trevor Noah, Shoto Kobe, Gugu Mbata Ro, Demi Lee Peters, Zozi Benzi Tunzi, and last but not least, business magnates Elon Musk. There are a number of South Africans who've excelled in different fields across the decades. These are but just a few South Africans that you geography peeps might be familiar with. Thank you. Truth be told, we, we all know Elon Musk, but like the first four actors I did not know were from South Africa. So that's pretty legit. But even to see the diversity of famous people from South Africa just is a reminder of the rainbow nation of South Africa. All right, and with that, we gotta move on to the next segment. Uh, this video's getting kinda long. Mm -hmm. You ready? Yeah. All right, let's talk about the friends of South Africa. All right, so South Africa and their click, who's in and who's close? Well, it really depends on where you wanna start on the globe, but put in a nutshell. As a member of the Commonwealth of Nations, of course, South Africa has always had many ties to their Anglophone counterpart. Was a bit of tension in the past, though, since many 
white South Africans choose to move to these countries in fear of policies they think might target them in South Africa. It got to the point where an Australian cabinet member even referred to them as refugees, which caused some backlash. But apart from that, overall, these three get along great. South Africa is also a member of the BRICS nation, the association of emerging economies being Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Together, these five have about a quarter of the world's land and about 40% of the world's population. They maintain a non-interference policy with mutual benefit plans. As a former British and Dutch colony, obviously the UK and Netherlands have cordial ties. Many South Africans visit or live in these countries. Interestingly though, despite a heavy usage of the Afrikaans language, South Africa has rejected all offers to join the Dutch language union and today stands in special partner status along with Indonesia. If you ask who South Africa's best friends are though, you probably have to head a little closer home. Today, despite being fully independent sovereign nations, South Africans usually don't even see Lesotho or Eswatini as separate countries. South Africa even has more Sotho and Swazi people than the entire population of each country. Same goes for the Swana people of Botswana. So they get these countries. In addition, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Namibia are also in the core group. They share a lot of the same ethnic groups like the Shona, Tsonga, and Khoisan. Granted, yes, there was a little bit of tension with Zimbabwe when they called for economic sanctions against South Africa during apartheid, and South Africa was pissed that Zimbabwe was hosting guerrilla rebels and really liked Zimbabwe's expropriation laws that kind of kicked out almost their entire white population. But nonetheless, they have good relations. As for Namibia, they actually were a part of South Africa until gaining independence in 1990, so there's a significant historical tie. Today, a huge portion of Namibia's economy is tied with South Africa. They even accept the South African rand as legal tender. And overall, they just really like each other when they meet up. In conclusion, I think uh, you should take it away. I'm out. All that to show, all that to say, South Africa has everything that you could want, can do, would like to see, or experience. Therefore, all that to say, I'm even the more excited, if I could be any more excited, about our move the family my family moved to johannesburg this year and therefore more reaction videos are on the way as it pertains to what we can experience look forward to or will do in our new home so with that being said any other suggestions definitely let me know in the comment section below and i'll look to get to it as i do see it now if you don't know you can go to our family channel where you can see us doing things talking through things and just living life even before we get to Johannesburg, but then especially after we move there as well. So make sure you go, I'll put a link down below so that you can get to that. However, with that being said, I love you all. I appreciate you all. Until the next video.